But what I, the one thing that I did want to show you before we leave, I want to show you this video. Yeah. Um, and I want to give you this invitation. Okay. And then, then we then we can, you know what I mean? Then we'll, then we'll let you have your time for the day. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Um, where is it? Right here. Okay. So. Why weren't they partaking in the Lord's Supper? Why? Yeah. Because it's only a certain amount that's going to happen. Only a certain one hundred and forty-four thousand. Right. Oh wow! And the rest yeah. of us, are, you can see that's, that's what I'm saying. But that's, see, that's what I'm saying. There's so much to process. learn. Yes. Yeah. To learn. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll talk to Terrence about that. Yeah. Yeah. So what? That's the uh, so, memorials coming. So yeah. the, so this is the thing. They have a special talk that explains more mm -hmm. about who who really is Jesus Christ. That's this this Sunday mm -hmm. at at nine thirty at the Lincoln Hall in in Rhode Island, right? So next Saturday, I mean the following Saturday, the thirty first is at seven o'clock at the at the Keith Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. You know where that is? No, nah, but that that's right in Lincoln over. You know where uh, R one or whatever that is, that new race oh, car thing? It's right it's right over there. Okay. So and that that's that's the memorial. This one's the memorial. This is the special talk that talks about who really is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I think you would get a lot of good information out of this and we would really like you to come and learn. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really good for you. So I wanna leave this with you. Mm -hmm. Um now, and, if I if I can when you guys come see me in my home church? No, we don't. Okay. Yeah, we don't. We don't go. This this is an invitation. Right. You can come. That right. that's on you. What you want to do? But so we don't go to any other churches. Fair. I'm just saying if that's, we, but, so, but that's, that's how it is. Choice, that's, yes. That's and and you have your choice. You don't right. have to come to. You this. don't have to come. But you would want me to. Uh, we love you. everybody to we come. Love yeah. Everybody to come. Do that's you want to wanna. No, we don't. We don't go back and forth to churches. Yeah, we, that's just not what we do. Right. I mean, not at all. so I, and I'm gonna be straight with you. That's just not what we do. Yeah. Right. So the thing is, this is up to you to come, and this is this is on your free will to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. We're just offering that invitation to God. But I should come. It. I, I think that's you would learn a lot. Talk yeah. to have that, a conversation yeah. with God about that's that. on you. Yeah. You know, and pray. We can't force anybody, but that's we're offering that. We're putting out that offer to you, and that's up to you if you'd like to come. There's no obligation. It's not like you have to do anything. Yeah. Or it's not like you're going to be converted or anything like that. Yeah. It's just a public talk. It's open to the public. Anybody. Yeah. Nighttime, I see diamonds in the sky. Daytime, I see sunlight shining bright. If I'm alive, how can I not testify? Of your love, your love, your love. Yeah. Your love, your love, your love. Welcome to True Prevails. Um... Just got back from the memorial and uh, really sad. The amount of people that are there that come to witness the Lord's Supper and um, no one takes it. And they just deny Jesus and put themselves outside in the new covenant, which would make their sins not forgiven and they would still be in their sins. and. It's real sad, you know, and the lies and the verses that take out of context, it's sad. So, we're going to do a recap. We're going to go through some of it. So, let's start it off. What can we do to show our appreciation? Uh, maybe there'd be big parades, fancy showings, uh, fireworks. And yet, Jesus commanded just a simple ceremony. In fact, if we can see this command, if we turn to Luke... Chapter 22, in verses 19 and 20. Luke 22, 19 and 20. It says, also he took a loaf, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. That's his apostles saying, this means my body, which is to be given in your behalf. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. Also, he did the same with the cup after they had the evening meal, saying, This cup means the new covenant, by virtue of my blood, which is to be poured out in your <clears throat> So, if you see here, it says, Do this in remembrance of me, not just to pass it around. It was to eat it. So, and it says, This is the new covenant. So, if you're in the new covenant, you partake in this. There's no two-class citizenship where some reap the benefits. That's not even in scripture. It's either you're in the new covenant or you're not. 
or you're still under Satan's authority and you're still following Satan and you're not a child of God. And <clears throat> there's no association, there's no there's no two. It's point blank clear. And what they keep doing this in remembrance to me, no one in the new where in the New Testament did the people just pass it around? There's nowhere. You're not gonna find an example of it of nowhere because it's it's not biblical. Jesus <clears throat> took a loaf of bread, broke it, said a blessing over it, and passed it to his apostles. Afterwards, he did the same with the wine. Again, a very simple ceremony, and yet it has great meaning because Jesus said, this means my body, this means my blood, and he added, keep doing this in remembrance of me. So being here tonight as we pass the emblems, it's not just the ritual something we just do for show. It has a meaning. And again, being here tonight shows that we appreciate what Christ has done for us. In fact, last year at our memorial, 20,175,477 gathered together at the memorial to express Numbers. Their appreciation. They care about tonight, the numbers. We're expecting a similar number, maybe even more. <laughs> uh, such ones will gather in over 240 lands around the earth. And that's a big number, but we don't necessarily appreciate maybe all the sacrifices that some made to get here. There was one sister, actually she wasn't even a sister at the time, who lived in Guyana, near the Maruta River. In order to be at the memorial, she rented a dugout canoe, traveled up that river, out to the Atlantic Ocean, where she hooked up with another river, the Pomeroon River, traveled back down to the place where she would attend, attend the memorial. It was a 19-hour trip. She did that with her two kids, and as soon as the memorial was over, she was renting the canoe by day. She had to quickly make the return trip back home because she needed to return that canoe. Oh, and by the way, she was four months pregnant when she made this. <coughs> What an excellent example of appreciation. A sum tonight. Hold on. Is that a good example? Are you you would ask yourself, wow, she did a lot. But the question is, why did she do this? Are Jehovah's Witnesses pressured to make these memorials and to be there if all possible? Let's read what their literature says. Paragraph four. Reflect on the importance of attending the memorial. Remember, congregation meetings are part of our worship. Surely Jehovah and Jesus take note of who makes the effort to attend this most important meeting of the year. Frankly, we want them to see that unless it is physically or circumstantially impossible, we will be present at the memorial. We, When we show by our actions and meetings that meetings are for worship are important to us, we give Jehovah added reason to keep our name in his book of remembrance, the book of life, in which the name of those who are in line to attain everlasting life. That's false in so many ways. So many ways. Just because you attend, don't don't aren't able to attend one meeting, your name's not removed from the book of life. Why? Because we're not saved by our works. Your book, your name was added to the book of life because of your faith. So why did a lady do all that, jump through all the hoops to get there? Because it was a fear that her name would be removed from the book of life. It's a different book of life. And, and who are in line to attain an everlasting life. It's not biblical. It's either you have it or you don't. There's no in line. There's no um, working up to it. None of that. That's not the new covenant. That's not biblical. The lands where the preaching work or the work of Jehovah's Witnesses is banned will risk imprisonment to attend this important meeting. But we don't want to overlook the sacrifices that you have made to be here tonight. Some of you are here for the first time. And we know it's not easy for you to walk into a building with close to 300 people in it whom you don't know. It takes quite a sacrifice. It probably no doubt caused you anxiety to do that. But you did it. 
we're happy to have you here. Uh, some, uh, on a Saturday night, would probably use this as an opportunity to get refreshed from the work that they've done all week, maybe even work that you did today. But now you're using this time again to attend this important meeting. Some may have even had to take time off from work to be here. Again, your efforts are appreciated. And then there are many who are dealing with illnesses, sicknesses, and the effects of old age. It's not easy for them to be here. But they've made this trip all because you appreciate the importance of the event. You appreciate what Jesus did for you. And no doubt, Jehovah God and Jesus Christ appreciate what you have done to come here. But again, this night is filled with important thoughts. It's to build our appreciation for what Jesus and Jehovah have done for us. And so we're going to answer some questions that will help us do that. Before we pass the emblems, we're going to answer three questions. Why do humans need to be rescued from the curse of sin and death? The second question, who benefit from Jesus' loving sacrifice? Three, who partake of the bread and the wine that is before us? And then after we observe the Lord's that is before us. And then after we observe the Lord's evening meal, we pass these emblems, we will consider the question, besides just being here tonight, what else can I do to show my appreciation for what Jesus has done for me? So we get into that first question. Why do we need deliverance from sin and death? Sin and death were never part of God's original purpose for mankind. He made the first man, Adam, as a perfect man. Before him, he put the prospects of living forever in perfect health in a beautiful paradise home. Being in subjection to him were the animals. He could live in harmony with other animals. He would live in peace with other human beings when they came onto the earth. And he would have satisfying, wonderful work to do as he took that paradise and extended it throughout all the earth. Not only could Adam enjoy these prospects, he could have passed those prospects on to his offspring. Do you know, because Adam owed all of what he had to Jehovah, it was necessary for him to remain obedient to Jehovah to enjoy these prospects. Sadly, in an act of rebellion, Adam disobeyed God, choosing to rule himself rather than to listen to Jehovah. Now an imperfect man, he could no longer pass on those wonderful prospects to his offspring. But instead, we can see what he did pass on if we turn to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So you can see from his comments... They blame Adam, and they they forget that God knew he was going to sin. That's why they knew, God knew he was going to send Jesus. But they're just like, man, Adam, you messed up. Basically, you messed up everything for us. Now you couldn't pass down the perfect, per, everything perfect. But did God know this? They're acting like God didn't, didn't know this, and he did. He already knew they was going to sin. And he already knew he was going to, to send Jesus. Just like the verses I have here pulled up. First Peter. 119 to 21. But with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Who was really was foreordained from the foundation of the world. But was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and give and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So this was for all day and God already knew God already had this plan. But they're mad at Adam. And what they don't get is they keep looking at the paradise earth. But we've lost our relationship with God. We lost that ability to be in his presence. And they focus more on the, oh, they focus more on the materialize the things instead of God. I'd rather have a relationship with God and live in this world. It doesn't matter. 
because uh, I have God, I know he's there, and now he's listening to my prayers and everything. And also, uh, Ephesians 3, 9 to 11. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God knew. So it's like, do you guys not read your Bibles? How don't you... To the intent that now, until the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold, the manifold uh, wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, eternal purpose, which he purposed in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. This was all a plan. This was all. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, That is why, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because they had all sinned. Yes, instead of passing on those wonderful prospects that Jehovah had given to Adam, instead he passed on to us sin and death. Now, we are used to inheriting things from our parents. In fact, if you go to the doctor, he's going to ask you about your family history. He's going to want to know, well, what things have your family members dealt with? Maybe it's high cholesterol, high blood pressure, something along those lines. And now that he knows that you have that history in your family, he can suggest maybe a certain diet that you can use to avoid those problems. Maybe he'll give you some medication so that you can avoid those problems. But now with sin and death, there is nothing we could do to avoid the effects of this terrible heritage that Adam passed on to us. In ourselves, we were helpless. We might ask, well, well, then what did Jehovah do? He had this wonderful purpose to fill the earth with perfect mankind, the perfect offspring of Adam and Eve. Would he just scrap that purpose? Well, if you had a detour on the way here tonight, or maybe a traffic gene, would you have said, well, forget it. I no doubt you would have maybe taken up your GPS found a way around that traffic jam, found a way around that detour, because you had the purpose of being here today. Would you think that one mistake by a man would be enough to thwart Jehovah's purpose? Absolutely not. Jehovah found another way to accomplish his purpose. And we can see what that is if we turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Today. He's making it seem like what Adam did to kind of threw God off. Made him take the wrong exit. What does Genesis 3.15 says? And I will put enmity between the, uh, thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and he, it shall bruise thee hell, and thou shalt browse uh, his hell. So God already put a plan. God already had the plan in place. He already knew. He already knew. He already knew what he was going to do. He knew he was, he was going to send Jesus. But they're making it seem like he, what Adam did, threw God off. See this verse, and he's both taking a verse out of context. In verse 7. This verse is referring to the sacrifice of Jesus. Notice how it is referred to, though, and what motivates Jehovah to give this gift. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Again, speaking of Jesus, it says, By means of him we have the release by ransom through the blood of that one. Yes, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his undeserved kindness. You see, if, and it was crazy because I was right there in the front and there was many times I wanted to just run up there and help him finish these verses. Because if he would have finished this you know, these couple of verses, he would have knew of God's plan. When you read 8, uh, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. See, that's what they keep talking about. Oh, can God, can he do his will? Now, Adam sinned. It's like God didn't know how to fulfill his will. He already knew how to fulfill. He had a plan according to his purpose which he sent forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time 
to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So God already had the plan. That's what they that's what they keep forgetting. Jehovah made provision for us by means of the the sacrifice of the son, but here it's referred to as a ransom. When you think of a ransom, what comes to your mind? Well, no doubt you think perhaps of a kidnapper who takes somebody and then demands a price in order to return that person. Likewise, Adam sold us into slavery, to sin, and death. The ransom is the price that Jehovah would pay to redeem us from that condition, to buy us back. What was the price? It's the precious blood of his son. What motivates Jehovah to give this gift? Ephesians 1 7 refers to it as the riches of his undeserved kindness. How can we make that make sense in our brain, that undeserved kindness? Think for a moment about perhaps going shopping. Maybe you're shopping, you see this beautiful article of clothing. You go over, you're looking at it, but eventually you're going to go to the price tag, right? Because you're going to want to know, is it worth the price? And maybe after you think about it for a little bit, you know, it's just too much. I just can't justify spending that much for that. Or another way of saying it is maybe this item doesn't deserve that price. But now picture Jehovah in that same situation, looking at you, me, and saying, what's the price? It's the price of my son. Jehovah could have said, I can't justify spending that much. They don't deserve that much. But instead, Jehovah looked at the most precious thing he had, and he said, you are worth it. How does that make you feel about Jehovah God? No doubt. We can continue to reflect on that, think about that, and how that would motivate us to feel about our God Jehovah. Another question, though, that comes to mind is, Jesus was just one man. Could the death of one man buy back billions of people from slavery to sin and death? How would that work? We find the answer at Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Romans 5, 19. It says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man many were made, so also through the obedience of the one person many will be made righteous. How did billions of mankind come to be in this condition of being subjected to sin and death? It was through the disobedience of one man, Adam. So would it not make sense that the perfect obedience of one man could redeem back those same billions of people who have been sold into sin? But now let's focus for a moment on Jesus' obedience, because it's important. Jesus needed to remain perfect through his death in order to equal out what Adam had lost. Which meant, as Jesus was growing up, as Jesus became a man, each and every day, as he faced trials, tribulations, opposition, he had to remain perfectly obedient. And he did that even through a painful, agonizing death. Now he could offer his life for mankind. But, as a perfect human, Jesus had the right to continue living. Okay. okay. He could have lived forever on this earth. So what? Wow. That statement, Jesus could have lived forever. Do you have a Bible verse to back that up? He was defined by time. He was a human. He came into a human body. So there was a point in time he was going to die. That was a crazy statement to make because he could not live forever. He was going to live forever because we know where he was. He knew where he was going to go back. But why would he want to be here forever? He had a plan. God knew that plan. It was a set turn. He had a sacrifice to make. He knew that, and he wanted to get back to heaven. Why would he want to stay here forever? 
and Jesus died. We find the answer at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews 2 9 says, But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death, so that by God's undeserved kindness he might taste death for everyone. Jesus took our place in suffering a painful a death. Again, Jesus, if he was just thinking about himself, could have said, it's my right to keep living. I earned the right to keep living. But instead of focusing on that, Jesus focused at our condition. He had compassion for the effects that sin and death have on the human family, and he was willing to suffer death himself in order to redeem us from that. See, what they miss here, see, he was made for a little while. So it's telling you at a point he is higher than angels, just like Hebrews 1 tells us that the, the angels worship him and he's higher than the angels. So as he humbled himself and came, yeah, as a man, he was a, he was made lower than the angel. And he's saying he, he gave up his right. He could have, he could have, lived here forever but what he's not understanding is he, oh he could have did his own will no he couldn't have done his own will what did he say i only speak what the father says i only do what the father says so if the father was here on earth he would have did everything jesus said because jesus is god in the flesh so they trying to make it seem like god, jesus was his own person no he only did the will of god he yes what he, he couldn't do anything else he couldn't step outside of his bounds. But see, people aren't reading. Digital witnesses aren't reading their Bible. They only, All you got to read is John. John 5. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you keep asking to see the Father? I, he is the Father in flesh. So no, he couldn't have stayed here forever. I, 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 I need a Bible verse for that. How does that make you feel about... And it's something that we can continue to reflect on. Now, though, because Jesus had offered his life, we, again, had the prospect of living forever. But where? Where would we? Would that brings us to our second question. Who benefit from Jesus' loving sacrifice? What? Yeah, because of what they're not telling you. All those people in that room, if you're not part of that 144,000, Jesus is not your mediator. Jesus didn't really die for you. You're not part of the 144,000. You don't have eternal life. And it's not biblical. But we're going to press him on it. It was Jehovah's original purpose for mankind to live forever on the earth. And that purpose that Jehovah stated would not be Changed. And so it's the same. The mankind has, the vast majority of mankind has the hope to live forever on the earth. However, the Bible does state that a small group would go to heaven to reign with Jesus. We can see this brought out for us at Revelation chapter 14, in verse 1, and it gives the exact number. In Revelation chapter 14, in verse 1. It says, then I saw and looked the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who have his name and the name of his father written in there. Yeah, see, they forget to read. They keep reading. They always do that. They cherry pick verses. Um, verse 3, and they were singing a new song before the throne, before the four um, living creatures, and before the elders. So you got the elders there. A separate class that came from earth that was with the 144,000. I'm a, I, I haven't had a chance to, but um, but I really want to just destroy that because, um, in another video, because that, that 144,000 that's one of the biggest lies, and, and people read the 
read the Bible, read Revelation in 7 where it says the great crowd and no man can number. Um, but there, there'll be another video coming on that. And in Revelation 14, 1 pictures Jesus again as that sacrifice. Mount Zion was always used in the Bible as a representation of Job's rulership. Because Jesus is king, he rules from heaven. Obviously, it would be a fitting a symbol of heaven. But now, it mentions that 144,000 from among mankind would reign with Jesus in heaven, ruling over the earth. Such ones know that they are of that group because Jehovah's Spirit tells them, gives them that assurance. We cannot decide where we will serve Jehovah. Jehovah of best decides. Again, we've talked about the greatness of this gift that Jehovah gives to us. If we received a great gift, we wouldn't complain about it and say, oh no, I want that instead. Not if we truly appreciate it. It's the same with this. Jehovah decides where we will best serve them. The 144,000 will reign with Jesus in heaven, and they will reign over again. Those who will live forever on the earth. So you're telling me I'm supposed to just shut up and accept it. That I'm doing all this and I can't be with God even though in the Bible he says he's going to dwell with me. I'm going to be with him. And I got to accept the 144,000. How is that fair? That's not fair. That's not right. That's not justice. That's not justice. And God is just. God is righteous. It's not just. How does that motivate you? I gotta do all this and then clean up the world after, you know, in the thousand year reign? Like, how does that, how does that motivate? How is that joyful? How is that fun? It's not the Bible. What blessings will we enjoy under the rulership of Jesus in that 144,000? We're gonna take a look at some of the blessings and as we do, you'll see. The blessings we look forward to are exactly the prospects that Adam gave up when he disobeyed Jehovah God. So we can first turn to Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 6 through 9. See the blessing that they read, they read a couple of verses, I'm not even going to get into it, but these blessings wouldn't even uh, pertain to them. They would pertain to the anointed. They read and saying, you're going to have this, t no. You wouldn't have that. You're not, they're not going to have that. That's for the anointed. They're making this two class like, citizenship, and it's just, it's not biblical. And so it is those who have that heavenly hope that would partake of the elders. The rest of us who hope to live on the earth are here simply to observe. Now we see this uh, brought out for us, or highlighted even further, if we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 26. And if you want to leave your Bibles marked there in 1 Corinthians, we'll leave them open. We'll be considering some more verses from there in just a moment. But notice what the Apostle Paul said about this observance. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says, For whenever you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. Paul used the word until. Speaking about those who would eat the loaf and drink the cup. Until highlights the fact that this would not go on forever. An event would end this. And Paul mentions in particular that it would be the coming of Jesus. Well, what happens when Jesus comes? Well, that group of 144,000 will be sealed. They'll be fully, uh, the full amount will be in heaven with Jesus. They'll no longer be on the earth. And at that time, Paul said, this observance will no longer be necessary. That highlights to us that, again, the partaking of the emblems is just for those who are in heaven, because when they're gone, we will no longer do this observance. We are just here to observe. Are they, those with the heavenly hope, are the only ones who are part <clears throat> See now, with the heavenly 
hope. In the Bible, there's no, there's no two classes. It's either you're going to heaven or you're not. And, and let's look at what First Thessalonians says. For it says, for the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of uh, trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. It's a blessing. We're going to be with the Lord. There's no group that's sitting to the side that we're going to do this that we're just passing around. Where in the Bible do we see them um, observing the Lord's Supper and just passing it around? It's not in the Bible. It's either you're in the new covenant or you're stuck in your sins. There's no second class. So now, friends, we can observe the memorial of Christ's death today. We're going to follow the exact pattern that Jesus set during this observance. So if we turn to 1 Corinthians, if you still have your Bible open here, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night on which he was going to be betrayed, took a loaf, and after giving things, he broke it and said, This means my body, which is in your behalf. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. On that night, Jesus took bread, said a blessing over it, and then broke it and passed it to his apostles. That bread was unleavened. Leaven in the scriptures is oftentimes used to denote sin. So the bread being without leaven would be a fitting symbol of Jesus' sinless, perfect body. And tonight we will follow again that same pattern. Our brother Roach is going to offer a <coughs> prayer over the bread after which it will be a pass. And more proof that more people than just the disciples took it, the apostle just with Jesus, when you read 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner would be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So they wasn't just passing it around. They were eating it and drinking it in remembrance of it. When they're sending this trailer around that says, do this in remembrance, um, they were eating and drinking it. 29, verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So there were people that were drinking this and doing this in an unworthy manner that still have sin in their life, unrepented sin. So where where's this group that just passed it around? You're taking yourself outside a new covenant. And you're not going to Disney, you're not gonna make it to heaven or paradise where you think you're going. This is a wrong gospel, wrong everything. This is this is all wrong. Wrong Jesus, wrong God. It's it's all wrong. And it's sad, like how how do you how did how did you even come to this point? And to and to it, well, you came to this point. Many many Joe Woodens has come to this point because they don't think for themselves and they just believe what, what they're told instead of reading it for themselves in conclusion they sent the cup around well they sent the bread around and you know i'm part of the anointed so i took it and what they do is they have two elders um, they have a whole body of elders that sit in the front and in and, and leadership that they they put up with deacons and they have one person going around passing around that standing in front of you while they're passing it and they have two elders on the, at the end of each row that uh uh, are watching to see who takes this and see who drinks it. So I took the bread and you should have saw the looks. Um, some other people behind me were wondering 
kind of confused look. I was looking around a little bit to when they passed around the drink. I took the drink and the elders knew because some of these elders had came to my house before, so I knew some of them. So after I went, um, no one really came up to me because I was ready to get in the scriptures um, and I want to look at a scripture um, that shows we are the anointed. But no one came up to me and said anything. Um, but I did it. The purpose was to make others think about it and make others question. Because at my young age, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be a part of the 144,000. But what they tell you or how you would know is the Holy Spirit tells you. So it's like anyone can say it. How can you confirm it? But I want to read one verse with you. So if you're a Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're really wondering, am I in Christ? Or am I in God? Or am I a part of the anointed? This is one of the scriptures that I help you out because they tell you, you won't have everlasting life until you keep taking in knowledge. Now, if you're a witness, ask yourself, what is that point where I can know? I've taken in enough knowledge and I have eternal life. See, they don't know. There's no goal. There's no point. You got to keep taking in knowledge. But the key is what type of knowledge? What are we supposed to be taking in? What was supposed to be taken in is the gospel that Christ died and he resurrected. And he's now living. He's raised from the dead. And now we have life. And once you know who God is, you know the one that he sent. And you take that knowledge and then you have life. So I really want us to look at, um, this is 1 John 2. And the main verse I want to point out, verse 20, but I want to read it from 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard from, that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you have all knowledge. So where's the second class? There's only one group that's anointed. There's only one. If you come to God, you're in that group. I want to read verse 20 again. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. In verse 26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and there's no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in him. Let the Holy Spirit, when you're anointed, you receive the Holy Spirit. And like John 14 says, it will teach you all things. So if you're struggling as a witness, just do your research. Just keep doing research and pray. God is faithful. God will be there for you. You call on the name of Jesus. He will be there. It doesn't just work for some and not for others. It's a hundred percent success rate. It's going to work. But the Jehovah's Witnesses, that the organization is, is a cult, and it's not the truth. It's not the truth. Bring your burdens to Him, and lay it at His feet, and He will take care of you. And I pray this reaches the many people that attended the um, memorial. Sad. God bless, like, comment, and share. Have a good day. Happy Easter.
Our Lord has risen, the living Lord. God bless you.